afternoon. I'm super excited to be here. I have just been saying again and again and again, oh my god, everybody should do one of these. A whole state conference focused on use of the internet equitably. Can I tell you this has never happened? So it needs to happen again and again and again. I'm Angela Seifer. I'm the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. I'm here with you from Columbus, Ohio, and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, so one of my favorite photos other, ever, other than the ones of my children, of course, is this one. What would you do to get access to the internet? Get your mom to put your PC in the car, drop you off at the library, right? I love it. So NDIA got started about five years ago because there wasn't a national organization representing folks like those on my panel, like a lot of you in the audience, that are working on equitable access to the internet and use of it. I think that's the thing that really that made me fall out of my chair this morning, is when Leslie said, yes, availability of infrastructure of the broadband is important, but if nobody's using it. We gotta make sure people are actually signing up. They have the skills, they have the devices. So this is what NDIA does. We pull together all the folks who are doing this work. Our affiliates tend to be uh, nonprofit organizations, libraries, housing authorities, local governments, churches, organizations in a community that are figuring out how more folks can have access to the internet that is affordable in their homes. We didn't used to focus on that in the homes part. Imagine now trying to always go find internet, it's a huge time suck, right? And it's hard, and sometimes you don't find it. So it needs to be in the home, it needs to be affordable, it needs to be at the speeds that you need to get your work done, and you need to have the right device, because a mobile phone does not always cut it, and you need skills, because we can't have the access and then not know how to use it. So what NDIA does is pull all these folks together, we help them share their best practices, and then we go do policy work on their behalf. We learn from them, I learn from their expertise, my staff learns from their expertise, we learn from their, their, um, their experiences on the ground. In the United States, digital inclusion efforts have been grassroots. They've come from the ground. There's been nobody saying, this is how you do digital inclusion work. Which means all of that work has been different. It's kind of good, it's kind of not good. It's good because it's very local and we love that local control and we love that it's about trust. The part where it's not so good is there's no money for this. That's a problem. One of the first things NDIA did was create definitions for digital equity and digital inclusion. Digital equity is the goal. This is where we want to go. Digital inclusion, this is the work. That's the how. It's how we're going to get to the digital equity. Who doesn't have internet? Roberto did some of this earlier. Uh, should share. Roberto's on my board. He's awesome. He was explaining to you the different ways of looking at it. A way that NDIA often looks at it is based on income. So in the United States, the less income you have, the less likely you are to have internet at home. Doesn't matter if you're urban, doesn't matter if you're rural, it means that internet's expensive and it means that we don't have the skills to use it. In the United States, 18 million households don't have broadband of any kind, not even a cell phone. 14 million are in urban areas, 4 million are in rural areas. I get really hot when I hear the urban versus rural. There's no versus, it's and urban and rural. We all have this problem where we have members of our society who are not connected and they are being totally left out. The internet is the ultimate bootstrapping tool and we don't have the tool. The amazing part about this event is that you all have already discussed availability versus adoption. This is, a, this is a, an idea that's often not grasped, initial, grasped initially. Yes, the internet is available to certain folks and in certain neighborhoods, but if it's not adopted, and it's not being adopted, we have to address adoption, not just availability. So let's talk about solutions. It's going after those barriers 
by addressing affordable broadband. And there are discount internet services that some of the providers have, some of the larger providers, some of the smaller providers. Those resources are generally unknown by a lot of folks. We need devices. You all have refurbishers in the state of North Carolina. It's awesome. A lot of folks don't. Cramden, is Cramden here today? Yay for Cramden. Most, most folks don't have. You all have so many things, I can't even tell you. You have an amazing state broadband office. Uh, there was a hearing in Congress a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Josh was there, I was there, Jeff was there from your state broadband office. And then the questions he was getting, I started to realize, oh no, these congressmen and women think that every state's like North Carolina. It's not. <laughs> they don't all have a Jeff. <laughs> They don't have a state broadband office that understands the difference between availability and adoption. So I had to say, look, North Carolina is the exception. They are not the rule. But I would love to see every state doing this. Digital literacy trainings, that's like this huge continuum of what a digital literacy training is, right? For some folks, it is how to use a trackpad, um, email. What is the difference between reply, reply all? How do you get an attachment? Like that's digital literacy training for some folks. For other folks, it's about privacy. Actually, for all of us, it's about privacy. Forever, you will never, I will never be done trying to understand how to keep myself and my family safe because it's constantly changing. Digital literacy training in the US, kids, adults, at whatever age, we are never done. The big challenge with that in the US is that we have to figure out how we're going to fund that and keep it going. It's not like you can get a grant from a foundation, put it in and be like, okay, we're gonna train these folks and then we're all sweet. No, technology changes, how we use technology changes. It's never finished, we're all constantly learning. The question is, do folks feel comfortable enough to figure out the next challenge themselves? That's really where we wanna get everyone. Quick um, list of some of the resources NDIA has. Guidebooks. We realized we just need some basic information to help folks get started. Because these efforts are so local, we learn from folks all over the country. There's a startup manual. It's really 101. The discount internets that I mentioned, if you look at that list of discount internets and you're like, hey, I know of one that's not on the list, let us know, please. I'm sure that's happening. And then coalitions. There's a huge value to folks talking to each other. Again, North Carolina leading. Uh, there's two coalitions here. I think they're gonna talk to you after lunch. That's amazing. Trailblazers. When we first started NDIA, uh, we thought it was gonna be libraries and nonprofits. That's who we thought was really gonna be a part of the community. And then local government started showing up at things. We're like, hey, who invited them to our party? But we were like, come on in, come on in, come on in. So the Trailblazers is the honor roll of local governments. So if you're from a local government, you have an amazing potential, and Josh is gonna get into that, of what you can do. So this, this Trailblazers has six indicators. I encourage you to go check it out. Our conference is in April. Uh, it's in Portland this year. We move it around the country. We were in Charlotte last year. I'm sure you the timing's a little bit off. <laughs> so real quick, some fun photos. Uh, these are some of our affiliates from around the country. And they're really in all different kinds of institutions. This one's a nonprofit. There are lots of local governments doing the work. Some of them are refurbishers, housing authorities. Oh, look, it's crammed in. That's one of my favorite photos of all time. And libraries, of course, quick note. Libraries are often not given the resources to do the work in this field that they are expected to do. I can't tell you how many times I've been told, ah, the library will take care of it. That is not the right answer. This is an all hands on deck kind of situation. So they're all over the country and we welcome you to also join NDIA, it's free. It's really about the community, to participate in our community and I love that you all are here doing this. So now I get the immense honor of being part of this panel. That's probably not where we want to leave that. Okay. 
So I do have a rock star panel here, and we're going to talk about what the rock star kind of activities that they have going on. So I'm going to start with Josh, and he's going to tell us who he is and what's going on in the city of Detroit. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is... Oh, okay. Yeah, you responded. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I meant to... I didn't mean to say good morning, so it wasn't just that. But um, So Joshua Edmonds, I'm the Director of Digital Inclusion at the City of Detroit. And, you know, as I'm looking around, uh, the best way to explain what I'm trying to do in Detroit is exactly this. Um, honestly, if I could copy and paste uh, one North Carolina uh, like, um, and, and what you guys are doing over what I'm doing, um, it would be the perfect marriage. And the reason why, um, a lot of people, in my opinion, are building donut models. Donut models are models that I would say when it comes to digital inclusion, they're people who are working around local government because they don't necessarily have a local government champion. They don't have someone who is in an appointed capacity next to their mayor, so that they don't have that leadership. So there's not a legitimate um, force for digital inclusion. So what that means is you're not really going to get the private sector buying that you need. And so really, you don't want to create those models. And so for me, having uh, the ability to champion local government is great. But at the same time, what's missing that equation is someone from my county, uh, someone from my state, and having that alignment. If you have the ability to do that, take advantage of that because that's going to, you're able to move so much quicker and you're able to do, uh, build robust partnerships. Because make no mistake, that's what I'm doing. I'm building robust partnerships because that's what it's going to take to bridge this digital divide. But beyond, I mean, obviously people are, are aware that in a lot of your cities, infrastructure might not be the chief concern or chief challenge, but it still is that adoption part. And so for me, really focusing on the adoption part, but doing it in a sustainable way, realizing that whatever we do can't be project-based, but operations-based. So I'm building an operation around digital inclusion, and I'm looking for alignment uh, within my government agencies and institutions, so therefore we can legitimize what we're doing and we're able to get additional investment. So let me ask real quick, what is your title, Josh? Oh, didn't I say it? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, if the, you did, let's repeat it. Yeah, so sorry, uh, the Director of Digital Inclusion, City of Detroit. That also is awesome. <laughs> Every local government should have somebody, should have a Josh, who's in charge of a digital Josh. inclusion. <laughs> hey, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Greg. Can you tell us about yourself and about what you're doing with the university? Good morning. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm Greg Clinton. I'm director of IT for the law school at NCCU School of Law. I said law school. So anyway, um, I am uh, originally from Durham, North Carolina. I'm, I'm one of those who say I'm happy to call North Carolina home. Um, I work in North Carolina, and I enjoy being here. Um, what we envisioned years ago in uh, 2010 um, we wanted to reimagine access to justice in North Carolina using telepresence and HD video conferencing. At that time, the NCCU School of Law had one of the best clinical educational programs around, and then we also had built a technology program that was pretty strong. And we wanted to merge the two strengths of those two programs to create what we call the Virtual Justice Project. <laughs> Now, the Virtual Justice Project does three things. First, it creates the Know Your Rights informational sessions. So we give people information about what their rights are in certain aspects of the law, using telepresence and HD video conferencing. The second thing we do is we create a pipeline of students coming to law school by offering virtual undergraduate courses in two areas, a legal writing and introductory to the first year law school experience. Now, whether people come to our law school or some other law school, we're just interested in people doing well in law school. And then the third thing we do is with the Virtual Justice Project, we have opportunities for our students to take courses while they're away from campus, particularly in the summer, using virtual technology. Now, when we started this in 2009, that was kind of revolutionary. There was no law schools doing synchronous distance education using telepresence and HD video conferencing. Over the years, we've created a network of institutions. We put equipment in a lot of libraries, churches, legal aid offices. So we have a, a lot of video conference equipment all over the state. And we've gotten several grants over the years to put equipment in rural North Carolina. And by the year 2022, we will have a presence in all 100 counties in North Carolina. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Amber, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and uh, the work you're doing with the library system? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. I am regional director of the Amy Regional Library System, which is Avery, Mitchell, and Yancey counties. So uh, to describe where we're at, I would say between Asheville and Boone is usually a, 
you know, a good starting place for you if you're unfamiliar with Western North Carolina. Um, I'm actually going to talk to you about two projects uh, at the state level, one of which I have been involved with very personally in our communities. Uh, the first is the Homework Gap Grant. And this is a collaboration between the partners of the North Carolina Department of Information Technology Broadband Office. They have been instrumental in working extensively to bridge the homework gap to better inform policy. And that partnership with them and the State Library um, has created the Homework Gap Project. And it's great to hear so many people mention the Homework Gap today because as public librarians and educators, that's very important to us. Um, so the project's purpose is to equip libraries with bridging that gap. Uh, public libraries, as many of you have talked about your experiences with public libraries, um, we work with so many different demographics in the public. Um, so this pilot program is also funded by a $250,000 grant uh, through IMLS, which is the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Um, so the way the grant works is we work with four communities, or four counties rather, and those counties are Caswell, Hyde, Mitchell County, and then Robeson County. And maybe some of you are out there today from those counties. So um, the partners, we distributed over 105 Wi-Fi hotspots to families. Those families were chosen uh, with a, a data assessment that we used with middle school. So middle school kids were, um, their families filled out the assessment based on their uh, ac accessibility to internet, affordability of internet, many different questions to determine who would be a part of it. Uh, and then we create digital uh, literacy classes at the school locations or at library locations as well. And that's with working with the student as well as a parent or a guardian who attends those classes. The great thing about this project is we're creating a toolkit. Um, so those partners I mentioned, the State Library and Broadband Infrastructure Office, they'll be creating a toolkit that can be used nationally. So um, other institutions, local government can create, and as well as public libraries and school systems can create a similar model. And I think that's the exciting piece of it. Uh, I also want to mention there's another program with the State Library, which is Hometown Strong. And that's funded through uh, Governor Cooper. That involves 14 counties and library systems who have received grant funding to um, increase their availability to digital devices that they can check out within their communities. So that's a little bit about those projects. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. OK, so now let's talk a bit about community anchor institutions. So all of these folks are from community anchor institutions. And as Larry mentioned earlier, community anchor institutions are essential. Uh, it is often a, the place where broadband is available. You all have heard the stories of people hanging around outside of the library or outside of the school after it's closed in order to get Wi-Fi. Um, it's beyond that, right? It's where we go for those, those digital tools. It's where we go to learn. But it also can be that connector into the community. So Greg, can we start with you and talk a bit about your program and how you see it in that, that broader frame of um, our um, educational institutions performing that role in our communities? As you all know, we live in a digital age, and those that lack access to uh, these resources are left behind. So I firmly, I firmly believe that universities are the foundation on which uh, communities <clears throat> and other anchor institutions like ours can address digital inclusion. Now, university, we um, serve a very unique role in the state. We educate the citizens. And having an access, we can introduce new concepts, new technologies, new programming. And we also are able to apply for large federal, state, and private grants to make these things happen. For an example, <clears throat> when we started with our virtual justice project, we, um, broadband in the state was not that great at that moment. But we, we invested in our campus and we invested in some of the local uh, anchor institutions to provide broadband to take the video conferencing calls that we were doing. As a result, those, institu those anchor institutions start offering programs amongst themselves. For an example, Legal Aid of North Carolina wanted to get into the video business. And they were traveling throughout the state to uh, have meetings. By putting video conferencing equipment in all of their locations, they were able to have meetings monthly uh, through video conferencing and save the travel costs. They are also able to expand their reach. For us with our uh, educational programs, we have students who were, uh, were not introduced to 
uh, MiFi devices or digital devices that took courses from us that as a result of taking courses from us have started using these devices in their practice of law now as well as in their communities. So <clears throat> at the heart what we do is we equip people with the tools necessary for them to um, be included in this digital revolution. At the heart of this is we are putting equipment throughout locations. So those locations are invested in broadband so they're able to receive the video conferencing calls and then they're beginning to create their program in themselves and as a result everybody, be, uh, everybody wins. <laughs> Greg, can you tell us some about your partnerships with community organizations including churches? Um, when we first started, um, we were with Legal Aid in North Carolina, four other state schools, a and Winston-Salem State, Feather State, and Elizabeth City State University. And uh, we were having programs in the evenings, and we found that uh, a lot of the people felt uncomfortable coming to the campuses at night uh, or on the weekends, and parking in some cases was, was an issue. So we decided to look at public libraries and churches. Um, churches were a, a, was a mainstay for us to go to because they had the audiences. They had the um, reach for the community as well as they need the resources that we offer. So we start partnering with churches throughout North Carolina. We have several different churches in, in several different denominations uh, that are, part, are virtual justice sites. And we're always looking for new sites. Our goal is not necessarily just to have a location in every county. Our location, our goal is to have loca locations or virtual justice sites in every community. That's amazing. Okay, Amber, uh, libraries, as mentioned, it's often become the place where folks are like, don't worry about digital literacy, the library has it covered, or don't worry about Wi-Fi, can't they just go to the library? Uh, you know, I get that's told that many times too. Uh, so how do you th see the role of the library in this issue of connectivity and digital skills? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I feel with um, the past just 10 years plus of working in public libraries that it is the space where when people say, I need Wi-Fi access or I need to use a computer lab, that's the first place they go. So we are known in the community as such, but I have to tell you with decreasing funds at the state and federal level, it's very difficult to provide what the public needs, but what we are good at are partnerships and collaborating. And when I say that, I mean uh, creating uh, technology help desks, one-on-one -on -one help, digital literacy classes that we create with community colleges and local colleges in the area. We work with our school systems, um, the, just the partnerships that we develop because we are the library and that central hub of connecting people is, is essential. I, I was really happy too to hear earlier the talks about meaningful connections because a lot of the families we work with in rural areas, they may not have access to devices like laptops or desktop computers, but what they have are a cell phone. But that's not necessarily a meaningful connection and especially when you don't have service where you live. So where the library steps into that role is they can come to us for internet access, but they also have access to a laptop they can check out, desktop computers in our computer labs. We also have the, uh, you know, the ability to increase our bandwidth in our buildings because of what we do. Not only that, but increase Wi-Fi accessibility by adding hotspots. Those are things that increase the, the viability of Wi-Fi within the building. So, um, all of that we do for our communities, and I think it's just getting started. I think, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely ramping up. Yes. The, the joke I often like to throw in is that uh, I'm really, really doing the same thing I've been doing for 20 years. Uh, hello, Errol <laughs> Reese, who I was doing this with 20 years ago. Uh, and my popularity has increased. So if I haven't changed, <laughs> something's going on in the world, right? Okay, Josh. Uh, Local governments as a community anchor institution in the role of digital inclusion. Um, so we have, in my opinion, a uh, natural obligation. In many cases, you don't have people who might realize that obligation because with, with government, the minute you commit to something, uh, well, you got to see it through because <laughs> everybody's going to say, wait, you said. And so for, for us, I think that you know, being bold and, and understanding our residents and our needs, if the city's gonna be offering services that are online or need to be accessible online, well then we should also be at that forefront of that conversation saying, let's ensure that our residents are taking advantage of whatever that is. But beyond um, simply residential, I would say that um, we essentially are the ultimate co-signer. 
before, in my, in my role in Cleveland, uh, so I'm, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I was working in public housing out there, and uh, President Obama's Connect Home Initiative. I was also working at the uh, Cleveland Foundation, philanthropic. But again, we were working around the city government, and it was so hard for us to essentially keep programs going. Now again, we were philanthropy. We had money. We could continuously invest, but it didn't matter if the local government wasn't there. Now, now that I'm in Detroit, I'm able to see essentially what happens when the city government's at the table. Not only are we able to accelerate partnerships, but we're able to be much more robust with those partnerships and getting those. So for example, uh, March 6, because uh, I was just looking at my calendar, I'm holding a uh, technology roundtable. At that roundtable, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Microsoft, Amazon, and pairing those with my library, with my faith community, bringing the whole community together. But again, the city is positioned to be able to do that because our mayor has said that digital equity is a priority. So now everybody has to fall in line. And so for if you're in North Carolina and essentially you're, you're a mayor, you're on the fence, I would say make the, in, the initial investment because what's that, what that's going to yield is more robust partnerships. And you guys already have essentially some of the key actors and key ingredients that you would need for it to live on even beyond what I'm able to do in Detroit. And so I would say that, again, my role in, in, in local government, it shouldn't be an anomaly. It should be what is, what is normal. Like, we, we look at that, that should be, oh, well, who's your person for digital equity? You know, you might have someone who's, you know, a manager or someone who's a coordinator somewhere, but no, put them at a director level and make sure that they're appointed, make sure they're hand in hand with that mayor, and make sure that the city knows and the state knows that it's something that is prioritized. So Josh, were you given a budget? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, okay, okay, uh, so no. Um, so, so the one thing that sometimes, well, you can't get mad at the, the cards are dealt, you just gotta play the game. And I would say for me, there was no budget, so they said, all right, Josh, go in here and bridge this digital divide, and man, did the media eat it up. Media was like, oh, we got this guy, he's gonna do it, he's young, he has the energy, and it's like, okay, sure. And then behind the scenes, I was like, oh my gosh, there's no budget. What am I going to do? There's literally nothing to do. Zero. I can't do anything. But then it's like, okay, once that initial shock wore off, I was like, all right, I can do something here. I then began looking at the power of social capital. And so I said, well, in lieu of me not having this, this hardcore capital to really do what I need to do, I can amass enough social capital, then use that to transfer over. I can make digital equity and digital inclusion so big and so bold that people would have to act. I would have to say over and over again where we rank up. So anyone who's trying to get in this work, know your data and know it really well. Because when you know those facts, people can't argue against it. So I began going to my banks and saying, hey, banks, if you guys are all doing online banking and you see all these people, this is central market share. Are you OK with letting that walk? If not, then let's work together. And I was doing that all the, all the time, and I'm still doing that. And so I would say you know, not having a budget was bad at the onset, but now it's actually a positive. Because now that I don't have one, I'm like, well, there's no budget. But it forces people in a way, and it forces me to actually reach out to people and say, we have to build relationships, opposed to we could build relationships. OK, but that's not to say that local government shouldn't have a budget. That, man, say that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hire someone like Josh and give them at least a little bit to hold some meetings, something, if man. nothing else, right? OK, any last comments, um, Amber or Greg, on the whole partnerships idea? That's definitely been a theme along here, that there's not enough resources in any one place, so we develop partnerships. Any last advice for folks? Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> my advice would be if you don't work directly with families or speak to the people living in your areas, um, then have staff that work with you who do. Um, because I work and live in a very rural area, and when you speak directly to families who do not have access to internet or devices, when they tell you their story of feeling disconnected, that's a quality of life issue. And so if you want to develop partnerships and collaborations, you need to be sitting at the table with people who have that instinctual desire to make the place you live a better place. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Greg? My advice is take, um, I use an old technology. I pick up the telephone <laughs> and call <laughs> partners and say, would you like to be one of our sites? And uh, once I start explaining what we do, people say yes. Uh, and that's how we've been able to build our partnerships. Awesome. This was my rock star panel. Can we give them a hand?